Gareth, for those that haven't come across you online, introduce yourself and tell our listeners what we're talking about today. My name's Gareth Shaw. Um, I work for a company called uh, Docair, and I'm uh, the general manager for global partnerships there. And at Docair, what we're doing is we're looking to empower life science brands and their marketing teams to better engage healthcare professionals and uh, you know pharmacists, physicians, etc., digitally through digital media messaging and adverts, but doing that in a way where we're driving a meaningful engagement and we aren't carpet bombing people with a whole load of messages and adverts they don't really want to see. We're making sure everything feels more like content and is part of the experience as opposed to an ad slapped on a page. You know, I think that physicians and pharmacists to an extent, but not as much anymore, but they're used to getting stuff brought to them on a platter in terms of they would have salespeople come to them and they would maybe give the salesperson, you know, two minutes of their time. And they're used to getting something that's nailed down. It was the job of the salesperson to nail down the information very precise because you know you have to put a bullseye on it because of the time constraints and so on of the physician. And it would be tempting with marketers to just throw the kitchen sink at physicians hoping something sticks, but they're not really used to that. They're used to getting stuff on a silver platter. And that's where you guys probably come in and narrow that down for them. And I think the key word is engagement. Yes. Uh, you, you, you hit the nail on the head with engagement. Um, you know, it's not around, you know, the way we view the world, it's not around how many ads did I show, how many ad impressions, you know, it is, am I actually engaging what's happening? Um, after that, as I had shown, you know, what's the behavioral or the attitudinal change in the audience? So, you know, we're looking past how many pretty pictures did I put on the internet or, you know, how many text files did I show and how many clicks did I get? You know, the online, it's all, you know, click through rate is still more popular than it should be, but you, you hit the nail on the head. Engagement is the, is the key word. Um, the way you talked about the, the salesperson, the sales rep, the, there are, there's a lot of hoo-ha out there at the moment. You're the death of the sales rep, the sales rep's going away. I don't, I don't actually think the sales rep is dead, but there are a lot less of them. Um, there's a lot less time for, uh, HCPs to actually engage with reps. Um, but because there are less of them and there's less time, they need to be supplemented with getting the right information to the right people at the right time. So it can help them basically do their job better and, mm -hmm. you know, empower them to give the best care they can. And that's where we come in because you, you, as you, the example you were given, marketers have sometimes been tempted to, you know, throw a, throw a spaghetti at the wall and see what happens. And I think for a long time, certainly in our industry, digital marketing was seen as almost like a box tick exercise. So I've got my sales reps, you know, I'm doing stuff around probably a lot of event-based stuff. Um, you know, I'm probably sending out pamphlets. I might be doing a bit of email. Oh, a digital. I know people spend more time on digital now. Everyone's like, more digital. What should I do? And it's like this box ticking exercise of, yeah. well, I'll go to, who are the big websites in, in, you know, the are relevant and I'll, I'll buy lots of ads on those websites and, you know, the, uh, it's the old quote. I think it's, um, I think it's an Ogilvy quote, but uh, it might not be, but the quite famous that I know 50% of my advertising doesn't work. I just don't know which 50% it is. That's right. I did, yeah. That, so I think that, that quote, because my background is, is from sort of, um, digital marketing across all industries. And I've been in, in our vertical for about five or six years now. And the technology has come so long now that you can make your marketing a lot more accountable and almost, you know, buy less ads, pay more for them because you know, it's the right, the right person in the right context to give the right message. So it's going to resonate. And that's what we're trying to do. We're using a technology that we call it was programmatic, uh, technology and programmatic just means we're using programs or machines 
to make the decisions for us. So if you think about um, think about how financial markets used to be run, all very people based on the phone, shouting tickets, mm. people are phoning for that, and now it's all algorithms in real time and the computers do all the hard work and the trades happen in milliseconds Mm -hmm. that technology um you know it's been applied in consumer advertising for 10 plus years so we've taken that proven technology that came into the finance markets it's been in consumer market and we've just taken it into the life science vertical where actually if you if you sort of think about how much data there is in terms of well if you've got a certain drug that you're just releasing and it treats a certain disease state, it, it's very easy to be very pinpoint because you know exactly, you take a very finite use case for what that drug or treatment does. And then there's only a finite, there's a very finite audience that would be interested in that. So rather than, you know, thinking, well, I've got this great, great new drug. I've just published a study. My efficacy is really, really good. I'll go to the two top publications in my field and I'll buy lots of adverts on there. And I know that maybe I want to really talk to about 40% of those people and the the other 60% might be interested, might not. So I'll Mm. take the 60% hit. And if I buy enough ads, hopefully they'll remember me and someone will click and read it. Whereas what we do is we take away that, all that kind of carpet bomb style. So, well, we can work out who they, you know, who those individual users are, not in a creepy way, but, you know, based on um, their online behavior, things like that, who they are and then what are they doing at that exact point in time? You know, what content are they reading about? Because mm. if they're reading, if they're brushing up on the particular area, you've just pub- published your study, we can make sure that we get the ad in there and we can make sure because it, it kind of, um, the whole technology, it works in fact, a bit like eBay, it works on yeah. auctions. So we can make sure, because we can say, well, actually, if we know that that person is clinically the right person for this message, and they're actually reading about the disease they or the treatment that this study is in, we can afford to pay, you know, several multiples of what the sort of carpet bomber um, blanket marketer would be paying because they're yeah. factoring all their wastage. So we would pay, you know, two, three times more win that ad, but then would get that result. And one of the, one of the killer, killer use cases we've seen in the US is around um, coupons, for instance. So it, it, probably more of a, a physician uh, than a pharmacist one, but uh, I think it also really brings to life what we're doing. So we work with lots of different websites, so journals, medical associations, um, peer-to-peer networking, but we also work with uh, specific platforms. So e-prescribing apps uh, or electronic health records. So imagine... We have a physician, they've logged into an electronic health record, patients come in, um, we're able to, so we don't, we're not, no HIPAA stuff, we're not, we're not taking any patient um, data. Yeah. But when they come in, we go, oh, they've got a patient and it's maybe a male aged 40 to 49, they're insured with whoever their insurance provider is. And then you can order some tests, make a diagnosis, prescribe something because everything's code based. We can see it, what those codes are. Now, if, for instance, they've certainly prescribed a drug where it's not covered um, by that health insurer, but there's a coupon that the pharma company has published and that money's spent and it's out there and it just sat somewhere in an office in paper form and no one ever links the two things together. Yeah. We can suddenly surface at that time. So the physician go, oh, cool. There, there's a coupon. So you think about the physician's really happy because... They can give the prescription with the coupon. So they know, well, I'm prescribing what I think is going to get the best outcome. If I give them the coupon, I've got a lot more chance of them fulfilling the prescription, taking it as prescribed. I don't have to worry about people taking half doses or, or trying to save costs. The patient's really happy because it's saving them money. And then the pharma company is really happy because, you know, they, they printed the, the, that coupon money there to be spent. You know, they yeah. don't want it to just sit there and never get spent because, you know, they want to drive their sales. So that's one of the, 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 the simple sort of use cases to really understand how our technology can work because we're able to take those different data signals and ping it together. And then so actually in this moment in time, we can do that because in traditional advertising, you know, you pay 
you, you pay on what's called a CPM. So you pay yeah. a certain amount of dollars for a thousand, a thousand ad views. Yeah. And, you know, there's, and the, the, the ad views can be counted in hundreds of thousands and millions in some cases. So if you're just trying to spread it thick, yeah, you'll, you, you'll get your message out there, but there's so much wastage. So I find a good mantra for what, what we do when talking to sort of marketers is don't nick at our technology and think because it's an auction, it's a way of buying buy media cheaply, think about it more of a way it's about driving better engagement, you know, getting the right message to the right person. And almost think, I want to buy less ads and pay more for them because I've got more insight into what's going to happen and what that behavioral change will be. And that's good for the marketer because it's good for, you know, their return on ad spend and return on investment. But it's also good for the audience. Because it means we get away from those like annoying, annoying ads. And, you know, so putting my consumer hat on, you know, I've, I've been in the industry a long time. I'm quite cynical and I'm, I'm definitely banner blind. You know, if I'm on Instagram, for instance, you know, and there's tons of ads on Instagram now and I'll see the bad ones and I'll just flip past them. I won't even register what they are because they don't feel like the content spirit. But I... I will click on Instagram ads. Now I bought things through Instagram ads, but there it's when the ad feels more like content. So when there's a brand and it's talking about something that I'm, you know, because all that data on what I'm interested in is on there. When the brand has done their homework and put me in as the right target audience and surfaces it, not just, you know, you're in, I'm in the market for a car insurance and a holiday and kind of, so well, let's try it for 30 days and you might fight one, but. What am I doing? And get really precise with not just who I am, but what am I doing? When when's the right time to show me that message? I think, oh, that's really cool. And it stops being an advert and it becomes more of a prompt to to, to make me do something. And we're getting, we've been getting more and more into um, looking at what is the behavioral and attitudinal effect of advertising. Because the beauty of our sort of, you know, the machines and the programs that, that power what we do, and we've got a, a really sort of cool, um, technology we call it, we call it Edspian, but basically it's a, it's a sort of clever data management platform that sits, you know, we're a marketplace. We have demand on one side, which is marketers, advertisers, and then we have supplier on the other, the websites and platforms where, where your listeners might go and do their job. So we're trying to connect those two. We have the technology. If we get that bit in the middle and we do a really good job of, well, who, you know, is it the right person? Is it the right context, right time? But then we can also start linking in, well, what happened then? So we do um, a lot of attitudinal and behavioral surveys, or we'll look at, um, in the physician case, we might look at um, prescribing data and anonymized prescribing data and things like that. But we link it all back. You can create a real-time feedback loop. So, you know, let's get that, it's kind of like compounding network effects. The more you run and the more information and data you feed the machine, the better the machine gets. And, you know, when you do it right, it's not just better for the marketer, it's better for the target audience as well, because it stops being about, hey, look at this, look at this. And it's like, here's a prompt. Oh, we just released this. And it's like, it feels more like that extension of what you're already doing. I know that you're HIPAA compliant, and I'm guessing that you can see stuff about the patient as long as you don't know who it is. My industry is full of acronyms. The acronyms are PII, so personal identified device. Sure. We have no PII on the patient. All we get fed is, uh, you know, physician one, two, three, just prescribed uh, um, treatment X, Y, Z. So you don't get the age and the BMI and that kind of stuff. Even though you don't know who the patient is, might get uh, might, might, might age, but no, no, it doesn't, we don't go too great. We deliberately don't go too granular on the patient side because because of HIPAA, we're we're HIPAA compliant, but we're very much more focused on. It's almost like B two B marketing. So, who is the healthcare professional? You don't need to know who the patient is, or you don't, and you don't need any sensitive health information because we're we're a global business. So, obviously, we're in the US. We've got HIPAA. Um, you know where I am. It's even yeah, more strict, you know, you have things like GDPR. So we are very careful around, you know, we don't know, we deliberately avoid knowing anything about the patient, but 
with very good understanding the situation of, well, who is the healthcare professional and what are they doing? They could be diagnosing and treating someone with arthritis, but we've got no idea who that person with arthritis might be. You don't know from their side, their income or their buying habits or whether they like brand names or generics or whether their husband shops or, or the wife shops. You don't know any of that from their side. You're just looking at that top data of the doctor and a little bit of stuff from the patient, but nothing on their end, yeah. even if it's clean, even if you don't know who it is. We're staying away from that because you have to be so careful when you get into it. But also there's a big element of, you know, as I was saying before, for an industry that is so good at using big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning for, you know, the advancement of treatment and R and D. And then you look at, you know, so you think about, uh, take it's the pharma vertical site, you got big R and D budget and then you've got a big sales and marketing budget and how much R and D embrace big data, AI, machine learning, all that cool stuff. And then you look at what the contrast that to what they do on the marketing side and it's such a golf. So we don't need to go that deep yet because there's so much low hanging fruit. The R&D is doing all of the market research and that to find out what drug they want, but the sales haven't caught up in terms of technology. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, definitely. Is that because salespeople and marketers have always felt sort of, uh, you know, artsy kind of the feel good side of things? <laughs> it would seem that if a ton of money is being spent, it would seem that R&D to make sure they have enough of a populace that has that disease and all that stuff. It seems like the sales side would use the same unless it's more artsy. Well, and I'm, I'm probably doing them a bit of a disservice. So they definitely, uh, they, I think they definitely use, they use technology and link everything together. But I think there's an element of, you know, it's it, very reliant on on the sort of set, uh, the rep or the salesperson model. And an there's an element of, you know, that model, you know, it worked pretty good for a long time, but uh, there was sort of a resistance to change. And if you look at the, the technology that we use, it's about 10, it would take 10 years old in the consumer world. And that's great for us because we can look at all the, the rookie mistakes that got made early on. Uh, and, and avoid them as we bring it in. We've got something that we know and it works. It's good enough. You know, it's good. Is it great? Probably not. But, you know, it does what, you know, I, I'd spend a dollar. I know I can get X dollars back, but I might not be able to, you know, know exactly which dollar powers which. And that, that, the, the main sort of difference. So I think because it's regulated, I think that there's a lot of risk around what was going on digitally. And I think that drove this golf. So to, to say that the sales and marketers don't use technology, I think I think would probably be unfair because I know the reps have access to you know lots of cool stuff and they all have iPads. It's all linked together. But when it comes to how they were leveraging digital advertising, they really been missing a trick because, like I say, they've been going with the old. If you think about um, you know how you how you would buy ads in magazines, you know, so oh, I'm a car brand. Um, you know, I'm going to put my, um, if I'm a luxury car brand, I know that people who read this magazine buy luxury cars, but hot, you know, the vast majority of the readers can't afford my car, but I'll still stick it and be adding that. And I think they still go with that sort of blanket approach of like, yeah, I'll, I'll take everything. And they just, it's the way they take advantage of all the data that just is a tax them on the digital life. And think about, um. I was talking to someone the other day and they were, it was like, what are the challenges? So what are, yeah, what, what are the problems or challenges that we're, we're looking to solve? And if you think about the, the, the pharmacy, uh, digital journey as it were. So yeah, you get up in the morning, you might check, you know, your favorite sport website, but then you might check your, e your work email, your personal email. Then you might look at some, you know, I don't know if there's like e-prescribing apps, but There'll be various platforms and websites that you're using throughout the day to help with 
your professional life. Yeah. And they're all siloed and fragmented because they're all individual platforms that do sure. an individual job. Our technology, basically, we, we're able to connect all those different silos into what is the digital journey of that, of that professional. Um, and that becomes very useful to a brand. You're somehow picking up that this physician or someone is on LinkedIn for a bit and on, you know, Google News or something. You're getting that information. We specialize in only professional environments. So we very deliberately don't look at LinkedIn and, and Google. There are a lot, there are some other companies out there that do it the other way around. And they say, we can find physicians wherever they are on the internet. And if I find them on uh, Google News or I find them on ESPN.com, they're much cheaper to buy because I, I buy them as a consumer. But then if you're trying to educate them on the latest clinical study, yeah, they're not in that frame of mind. So, so we, we've built a network of um, various professional sites and platforms. So online medical journals, medical education, medical association. So we build out and the way advertising used to work would be all these different, you've got some of the big journal, they're massive, but actually when you, you want to, if, as a marketer, you're not interested in that huge portfolio, you're interested in one or two things, but then you'd also be interested in, well, what are the people who read that journal, you know, do they go on sort of peer to peer networking sites and do they, you know, do, are they asking questions to their peers, but, oh, how did you count with this and what you do? And then, you know, are they using a prescribing app? Or, you know, are they doing a telemedicine consult? Because of all these different digital touch points throughout the day all existed as different silos. So for the marketer to be able to do effective digital marketing, then really if they wanted reach, they'd have to go to the big players, give them a, a big chunk of, of, of marketing budget, and then overexpose, you know, that little bit. And, and I think medical education is a good one because it may be, you know, you spend two or three days in a given week, you go quite hard on a medical education site, but then you might not go back there. You might not go back for another six weeks, but you are going to other places and doing other things. So by building out our network of all these different digital touch points, we're able to take these previous uh, un unconnected sort of siloed digital experiences and weave them together into this sort of patchwork of, well, what is a healthcare professional's digital journey? Do you have agreements or something with these other peer-to-peer -peer things in that where you can get that information? So we don't own any um, client facing stuff. Um, we work it. So our network, as I term it, is we go to all the different app owners or website owners, and we 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 basically do deals with them so that we can then connect. And then we try and do is whenever we're able to identify someone, so they may have logged into any prescribing app, so we're able to say, ah, oh, cool. We know we're, you know, we Same know where person. they're based or, yeah. Yeah. But then we're able to, in a sort of um, uh, data regulatory compliant manner, then match that person to, oh, well, then I can see them move through um, my network. And that's, that's the real power of what we do, because when we're able to, build that uh graph or map as if that book and then you know it's not we're not, not being creepy we're not stalking people around the internet like that but you build up that picture of well what is the digital journey and because we're then as they build this sort of network effect of the more messages we show and then we're learning well when we show this message to this you know this cohort of, of people in this environment they respond better than this environment or that creative message and we're able to feed the machine so it may be that the time of day of when you show a message can have a big impact because people come in the morning they might be head down because in the morning i need to clear the deck and then i thought um you know but i had there's an hour of time where i do my and so you start to pick off on what what is that sort of sweet spot of when because if you show it in the morning versus the afternoon mall or the other way around or someone might be on their mobile phone with their desktop at their desktop, they might be at work and their head's down. I'm just going to get, get this done to get on to the next thing in my day. Whereas if they might be on their mobile phone and they commute later, so you take all those different data, you know, we take all those different data points, 
feed them into an intelligent machine. And, you know, it's not, you know, we're not setting these new, you know, one rule, you know, we're not doing carpet bomb rules. You start, you know, instead of trading ads on packs of a thousand stacks, you know, a thousand, one thousand, one thousand, you know, individual one, one to one sort of ads with the data that sits behind it. Is your agreement with the other software companies, is that live in terms of, you could say that when people leave the peer-to-peer network, they're chatting, they always go here to verify what somebody said. Are you able to give them an ad when they came from somewhere, like real time, or is it more of a, a generalized feeling? It's not quite as granular as your example of being able to, you know, go from here to here. Um, sometimes it might be, but it's more of a case of if it's a particular, say, take a journal's a good example. So a medical journal, they've published a article. That article's going to sit there for, you know, it's just almost going to be evergreen, um, you know. So w- once we've read that page, we, we contextualize it. We know what that page is about. So then when we, and if we know we've got everyone in this the graph or map. So as someone comes in, if we know, well, actually they're, they're really interested in this and they're reading about this as well. Then we go back, you know, two indicators, bid high. So, so we go different data pockets and then it's how we layer them together. So it's, you know, what do you've got your audience, you've got your kind of page context, you've got your time of day, you've got what, what is the creative message? You know, a lot of, a lot of time you can do creative testing. So you might say, well, I've got this creative message and this creative message, but A, B test them. And it might be one just is better, but it may be that one works better on a networking site, whereas one works better in an app and all this different stuff. When I had started on LinkedIn, let's say, you know, 10, 12 years ago or whatever, and just setting up some groups and things for the local physicians and pharmacists and things, it always seems like physicians back in the day on LinkedIn were very few and far between, and also attorneys. And I asked somebody one time, I was thinking, why is it with those two groups? And someone said, well, they're busy. And I thought, yeah, they're busy. And I thought, well, with attorneys, they probably don't want to afraid they're going to give away free advice and doctors, maybe this or that. When you see physicians, what is their feeling in general, in terms of being an early adopter of anything? Are they usually late adopters of stuff because they're used to hands-on manipulation of the body and things like that? And like this technology is I'm not going to deal with that. Or do they try to stay off social for any different reasons? Do you see any trends with physicians? It's a bit of a mixed bag. I mean, if I was making sweeping sort of generalization, um, older, older, uh, physicians are generally a little bit less tech savvy, not to say that all old people are, but there is, there is a little bit of gold. You know, you look at some of the data with, you know, digital engagement and that there's a sort of sweet spot from sort of, um, you know, mid to late thirties into early forties and sort of down very sort of tech savvy, you know, and that, look at a lot of sort of the surveys, like, you know, you, like in industry surveys on like, you know, how do you want to be engaged with, oh, I like, I want to be engaged with digital. My show, the main curve on top is 35 to 45 year old males. That's the audience. Yeah. So they kind of seem similar to that. Um, what I find is we do a, we did a lot. Um, so I'm sort of based, based out in Europe and we've been doing a lot in Europe. It's very sort of web by, website based. And I won't sort of bore you with sort of the legalities, but, um, we can only show any promotional content around prescription drugs to HCPs and HCP environment. So the, the way to do that is go to the HCP login website. Um, but there are also, we have EHRs, we have e There's all these great little, and the sort of, well, the, the startup world, the health tech has just gone crazy. Um, and it's a lot of the people I meet when I go to different conferences, they are all, well, not all, but a lot of them are sort of younger so my age and down, I'm 41, so a little bit older and, and, but they've been doctors or, or some sort of practitioner 
and they've just been fed up with the status quo. So they've been like, I'm going to build a better mousetrap. And then when we start talking to them about, oh, well, oh, we're all about making sure we get the right message to the right person at the right time so they can be better at their job and give out better care. And the, what, this is how we do it. And they're always super interested. And it's not always the right time because they usually, you know, you've got this cool stuff. It's like, well, I need to, their challenge is they need to get it out there. They need to get, you know, whether it's um, NRHS truck, they, they need to get someone to buy it to get some people using the platform. But then when they've got, that kind of critical mass, then they're like, oh, this is, this is quite interesting. So um, to make sweeping general statements, yeah, sort of mid 40s and, and down are a lot more tech savvy. Some industries like real estate, realtors, all the old farts are doing everything. Yeah. They're sending out postcards and doing online stuff and that. I think that's maybe more who that kind of person is who's in real estate. You know, they're maybe more outgoing than the average. And they know they need those connections and they have to stay part of the household name and things like that. So probably certain industries tend to maybe shift different age sets in a general sense, I guess. Yeah. And no, I, I, I think, and I think it's what drives what we do is uh, consumption. So if you've got people who are like, no, I, I, you know, I still scrap, you know, my, my journal, my medical journals dropped through my letterbox and I, you know, and I, I, I went with my own habits. I went kind of, I stopped all my magazine subscriptions and I started off again because I, I can't quite like, but don't, don't have as many now. Um, but you know, that, that it's all about the consumption. So if they're heavy consumers of digital content, that's where we'll see them the most. But the beauty of what we do, one of the things that sort of makes us stand out and be a little bit more unique is we're not just looking at, you know, your, your sort of website. We're looking at the platforms as well. So e-prescribing, telemedicine, um, electronic health records, because we looked at, well, how much time does a physician spend in front of a screen per day doing their job? And it is a lot. And then who are the partners we can bring into our network that are owning that digital experience as part of that digital journey? And is the synergy with Hey, you're a website, you like ad revenue, we can help you be better at it. And, you know, we'll do a deal. But, um, you know, if it's electronic health record, that example I gave earlier about, about the coupon, we all know the coupons exist. We all know that like 80% 80 plus never gets spent. You know, we, we firmly believe that that is a, an issue around sort of location based that they get sent to the office and then they sit in an office and the physicians in a different room giving it. And the, the two things don't, two, you know, physically don't meet. There's not enough time to go on for in them. And, but if we can surface that, that EHR is like, actually, that's going to make my, I'm going to, that's going to make my HR stand out against my competitors. So that's going to mean I can sell to more hospital groups because what hospital group wouldn't want coupons to be surfaced automatically? Um, so it's about finding who's controlling that sort of screen time. And then what, how cool, what we're doing and what they're doing and fundamentally what, what the healthcare professional is doing on the other side of that screen, how can we link that together to make it better for everyone drive that sort of synergy? Because we don't just want to be a company that throws out lots of adverts because we, we want to drive engagement because that's how, you know, we're a start. We want to yeah. be a billion dollar unicorn. For sure. And we firmly believe that, that in, engagement, that's been the missing piece for the digital marketing. Because the rep will, you know, if the rep went into the office, you got engagement, you had a conversation, but as that gets harder and harder to do, and with COVID completely locking that down for, you know, however long in various different countries, digital had to turn to digital. And I think yeah. now the genie's out of the bottle, it was, well, rep, and it was all digital. And now that the buzzword is hybrid, the smart people, they'll hybridize it, but they'll make it click together. What is the most effective metric in your mind? What's the most powerful thing you could sell to a company and say, look, here's this metric. And it's a huge metric because we can, you know, prove this. What would it be? Uh, so classic, you run a, a small technical control group and then you look at, well, what were their prescribing habits before 
the campaign started and then what happened after. So how many new scripts, how many total scripts, how many new to brand scripts. And, you know, and then you can break it down even further. So if someone saw the message five times versus 10 times, you know, what was the impact and, you know, can you sequentially message? So did you take, you know, the, oh, I showed them this and then I showed, you know, and there's like an ed, as I educated them or they went through different cycles. Um, yeah, so script, script lift is massive in the States. Um, outside of the U S, uh, script data does exist in different markets. Uh, but, um, probably it'd be behavioral attitude will change. So we'd look at, um, survey base. So just how we can, just how we can target anyone, you know, within our network with a particular message from, from a brand, we can also target them with a message from us. So we could, you know, send them a survey. This is, um, probably the easiest way to understand this is if you've ever spent any time on YouTube, you know, YouTube show their ads and then periodically you'll get that survey where it's like, oh, which brands do you remember seeing an ad for? And if you did, yeah. And then it, yeah, they're not very long. They're actually like four or five questions, but it's, do you remember what were they talking about? Are you now more likely to, you know, buy that brand or describe that brand or what is your attitude towards that brand? Um, so that kind of attitudinal behavioral change. Um, so in the absence of stick data, um, it would be, is my message resonating with the audience? I had a manager once and he was really, he basically said, whenever you have a meeting, there might just be one thing you want them to remember. And it really, that is the killer metric. So whatever my company, you know, what I'll want one thing to live inside that audience's head. And if I can, someone can show me a metric that's statistically relevant and all the things that it's like, is that thing like that behavior also in scripts? So are, are the scripts coming in physically? Are they, they being written and being fulfilled or am I get, you know, am I now living in that person's kind of, um, thought pattern? you know, are they, are they now aware of before I did this, they didn't know X now they know X and I can prove it. I don't know. I'm seeing that in my bottom line. If you had all the money in the world to do this. Are there any metrics that could be almost like instantaneous that really meant something? The script volume, of course, is the most important thing. I'm just trying to play in my head if there could be anything that would be ever better than that. Theoretically, the answer is, is yes. The script data, because of the nature, we actually pull it in in real time. So traditionally, if you run a campaign, you know, you might go, oh, I'm going to run a three-month campaign. I'm then going to pull it all together, take a couple of months to reconcile it, get all my data, then my script data will come and maybe three months out of the, after the fact, you can look at, well, what happened? We pull it all in in real time. So we couldn't do it in 60 minutes, but once you've been running a campaign for about a week, you'd be able to start seeing, so if you're running that three month campaign, a week in, well, probably in a few days, but once you're a week in, you'd probably start to be seeing enough data the, then the machine or, and also you can, you can sort of push the machine in different directions with hands on keyboard as well. You can have enough data. We'd be able to start feeding that, feeding that in. Um, the other part of your question though, so that, that's how it works now. The bit that is exciting if it's done in the right way. And this isn't, uh, you know, we, 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 I, this isn't me. So I'm not talking about roadmaps or anything like this. It's me just with my, Gareth hat or not my docket hat is the amount of, um, oh, I've been, I've been on the, you know, the, the smartwatch wearable thing for a few years now. And the amount of data this thing's picking up, I can nerd out on it all day, you know, on my vitals and things like that. And what's happening just with the NHS, and I think America's probably even, well, America is, is a head, like being able to carry your health records around. But also if you're getting any kind of treatment, being able to lock, starting to log that data or getting the reminders of like, when should I take my tablet? The day is going to exist because technology is giving, adding value. You know, I, I, I've been rehabbing a shoulder injury and my physio for me, yeah, download this app. My rehab exercises are all in there. I fill it out. I say how much it 
for each exercise on which day. And then it, I get pretty little graphs that I assume my physio is going to look at. And when I missed a couple of, I didn't do it last night, I'm probably going to get a slap on the wrist. As technology is used to solve more and more problems, just make our lives easier, that's going to generate a lot more data. And if, as an industry, we are respectful of how we use that data and we harness it in a way where then it adds value back to, you know, the, the end user, the brand, um, and the service provider, it's that conduit between the two. You know, it's very, very powerful. Remember the Tom Cruise um, film, Minority Report, when he's, he's walking through the shopping mall and every, he just re- everywhere's reading his eyes and like every wall is like an advert talking to him and like a cereal box is talking to him. We don't ever want to get to that Minority Report level, but there's a way, a much more socially responsible way of doing it where it just, it makes everyone's life better. Some people say, I don't want the internet to know this about me. I want my privacy in this and that. It's like part of it's because I own my own business. I guess I wouldn't want my boss looking at me, but a lot of stuff, it's like, yeah, watch me, watch what I'm doing and use AI to, you know, tell me this and tell me that. I have a new website for my show and I didn't ask for it, but on there is a little box that says I am not a robot. That box, they know that the average person, especially an old fart like me, is going to wiggle the mouse around and then maybe go up and do it. They can tell a human's doing it. And when you talked about hovering and things like that, what methods are there from computer companies that we consumers don't even know you're watching, like hovering and eyeball movement and things like that. And then here's the big question. Are these apps like Amazon and Google, are they listening to us all the time? Because we all have stories about, yeah. you know, I talked about a dog collar or something, and pretty soon I'm seeing yeah. this, you know, dog collar. So what are some of the tricks of the trade that people say, oh, I didn't know they could see me hovering. And then what are those tricks? With the with the hovering, so... If you're aware, so if you own the website, you can be you know, to your website. So you can look at where people are mousing over and scroll, scroll the loft bit is a, an interesting one. So say you're reading, it, reading an article, how quickly you scroll. If your scroll velocity is really quick, you haven't read it. But if I'm reading an article, you know, quick readers will be a little bit quick and slow, but that, how quickly people scroll through a written article. That's, that's really interesting. On the advert stuff, you could only tell if someone's hovering over your advert. You can't tell what they're, if they're, they're not on the advert. And then with the eyeball tracking, that's uh, usually panel-based. So that's people who know their eyeballs are being tracked. So it's not your webcam turning on and looking at the world. Alan? Yeah, just there are, there are a lot of companies that it, I'm sure everyone's got a story about how you know, you, you look, you look, you bought, you bought a pair of shoes or a tennis racket online. And then the next month you got stalked with the advert. That's a ta- tactic called retargeting. And I think that was one of the things that the industry as, as a whole sort of did wrong. Cause what it, you, you, you have the sort of sales funnel, right? You have what, drive awareness right down to driving the sale. I think one of the things where I was saying about how we get to avoid some of the mistakes because we're coming to the party a bit late is everyone found, well, I'll do awareness and then I might um, do some more targeting stuff and, you know, good and build it. And then the thing I know that I'll get the most sales is people who put something in the basket on my website, but they haven't checked out yet or they just, or they put it in the basket and they might have checked out, but I haven't built the logic to work that out and I'll just throw ads at them. And they'd always get the most sales off, off that box. And the chances are, you don't need to show the app. They probably already make a mind up. They've done all the research. They're just waiting for that, they, that five minutes where their kids aren't shouting at them or, you know, just to, just to put it through. So there is an element of that, um, you know, Alexa and Amazon and, and um, you know, Facebook, Instagram, they are all very good at picking up on, you know, what you're saying. They are listening. 
It's been a while since I've looked at their T's and C's. So don't quote me. I think somewhere in the T's and C's for Meta, which is Facebook, WhatsApp, and well, actually not, maybe not WhatsApp because I've spoken, but they are knitting. I know Google um, will look at text-based stuff out of emails. I don't think they read your emails. I think they look at different keywords. The internet isn't free. Yeah, you need to be comfortable with that. You're not the customer, you're the product. In some instances, yes. And it, you have to be comfortable with that. For instance, um, go on YouTube, right? Um, well, I don't know what YouTube premium costs. They're always prompting me. Sign up for 12 bucks or yeah, something. Yeah, 12 bucks. It's like, take your month free, but then sign up your credit card. And it's like, I'll just, I'll just stomach the ad and I'll skip through them. And then the ones they won't let me skip, I'll just watch. Is you know I don't want to I don't see the value exchange in the twelve books, um, but then other other things I do. Um, you know the big uh, the the big story recently has been Netflix. You know they're going to start doing advertising, so there's going to be a cheaper a cheaper Netflix where they're going to run ads. Um, and it it's that you know it's that value exchange. I think it used to be a lot creepier than it is now. I think a lot of brands, especially the big guys, have realised actually we can't. We can't take liberties with people's data. You know, it's, we have to respect it. But at the same time, it's all in their T's and C's. Um, all the big guys now, if you, you can probably within five minutes, if you know what you're looking for, find out where all the data they keep on you is and then tick, with, tick what you're happy with and what you're not. Yeah. But uh, you have to sort of be comfortable with, like, like you say, like that you're, you are a certain extent the product. There's a good stat with Apple and Google. Like with the iPhone and um, the Android phones, I think they were saying that uh, these numbers are probably a little bit made up, but I think Google were pulling off 2,000 data points from an Android phone a day, whereas Apple were pulling off 200. So it's about 10x more data, but then Google phones are a lot cheaper. Uh, Apple's did a really good job. They sell privacy as a feature, but hey, we're a luxury brand, you know? Look at all the privacy. It's like, oh, is that a human right? Is it a luxury product? You could, you could argue that, but it's a bit of my pig, right? Someone had told me one time, they said, no, and I could see this, but they said, no, the phones aren't listening. You said they are, and I believe they are, but they yeah. said the phones aren't listening. They're able to tell so much stuff in your searching that you don't realize. Let's say you looked up batteries and then you looked up camping and you looked up something else those computers are so smart they can tell that this person is going to look at you know ritz crackers and cheddar cheese the next day or something you know they just know they have so many points that's exactly what your program is doing because if i'm going camping i want Ritz crackers to show me their new thing and i want to see what cheeses are out there because i'm going to have cheese and crackers i don't consider that a bad ad and that's what your business is doing of making it so important that people don't see it as an ad they see it as something they're welcoming it, yeah it, exactly that you know and i i find fun a little bit at sort of facebook because it's easy because they've got so so many public instances when they've done things wrong but you know they're not i don't think they're well you can think what you think about their management. I don't think they're they're trying to do anything blatantly too wrong now. After they kind of, I think they got caught up with their hand in the cookie jar. Not so much. I think they were a little bit more naive as to what might have been happening on their platform. Uh, but you know, like Amazon is really interesting because Amazon, their sites, their apps, amazing. You know, Alexa. It makes everyone's life so much easier, but they get all that data and they are one of those, you know, in terms of consumer brand, everyone is working with the Amazon platform in the background, but they don't show any ads on Amazon. They take that data and they use it across the rest of the internet. But for your example, if you just bought a load of camping gear, you know, you're probably going to want the crapper ad to remind you to get the stuff to make s'mores before you go. But you'd be like, oh yeah, I I need to pop down to the store and, and get that. And, you know, it's that thing. And, you know, the data is there. And it's the, the sort of smart, savvy marketers that work with 
the you know the the small savvy um, platforms to make those campaigns and all the sort of small people who are thinking lo- about the long game now are like I need to you know and this sounds really corny but I, I need to use this data and this power for for the good of the end consumer I can't just be chasing my bottom line you know in in I think about in Europe now. Because we have GDPR, everyone, every, you have to consent for everything. So if you're a brand, it used to be really easy. You know, you could, you know, get hold of my data, find out who I am, and target me that. Now you need me to consent into that. Uh, but if you're a good, if you're a good brand, and I trust you, and you know, I get something by giving you my consent to hold my data. I'm getting something that's valuable back. I'll give it, but um, you know, I, I'm not. Not throwing stones at any brands, but McDonald's, for instance. Every time I go to McDonald's now, they have these like automated. Take my, my kids look happy meals, so I take I take them in on a, on a Saturday for a treat, and they have these automated uh, screen. Um, and you put your order in, and it's constantly. Would you like to log in? Uh, no, no, no. I will check out as a guest because I just want to buy two happy meals. But there's no, and I'm sure if I was needed a lot more McDonald's. There'd be some sort of loyalty program. That, but for, there's not enough value. McDonald's don't give me enough value for surrendering that data. And that's what you've got to get right. And that's where I think, as we, particularly for our industry, because, you know, you, you just have to, you've got to stay up to the thing. You've got to stay up to date, you know, to remain qualified. So the appetite to get the information is there. The digital vehicles to provide the information are there. And if used in the right way, it can be win win for, you know, the, the, the brands that want to dominate the information, uh, the platforms that the information is going across, and fundamentally the end user. And then by giving that end user, the, the healthcare professional, that information, it benefits the patient who really is, you know, that's what we're all, we're all driving for. So, it's about making sure that that value exchange and transparency is there. It's interesting you say McDonald's because that's an example of if you don't do things right, you can come across that your technology is worse. We've got this McDonald's and I did the part where you pull up into the, they've got these parking spots, one, two, and three, and you put your order in and you say you're in spot two or something like that. And they're supposed to bring your food out without you going through the drive-thru. And I've had enough times where they forgot about me, where the kid says, you know, pull up and we'll be out there. And they never do it. So I go up and I say, I'm number two. I sit there for like 15 minutes. There's about 20 cars in the drive-thru. I know there's no way in hell I'm going to get my food. I actually took off and wasted my four bucks or something like that. I'm not going to sit there. But that's an example of a company that maybe they're forward thinking, but in a hurry between your story and my story and other ones like that, it's like no one's going to trust it. And once you've lost that trust, you don't want to give your name and then this and that. You got to do it right. A hundred percent. And you've got to, what is it? Trust, trust take, takes a long time to learn and can, can go in a second. And as a brand or a marketer, you can't. Think of it as a box ticking exercise. You can't think, well, I need data or I need consent. It can't be ticking a box. It's got to be, forget about, I need this data. I need, think about, you know, to your question earlier about the metrics, what, what do you want to happen? What do you want to do? You know, think about that. And then what is the best way to make that happen? And look at all the tools that are available to you. And if you're not, if you're not a, um, if you're not well versed in it, look for a partner that is. You know that could be an agency, it could be a platform like us. But ask the, ask the right, learn what the right questions to ask to find the right person who can help you do what you want to do. But don't get weighed down thinking we. I need I need a database with this many pharmacists in it because that's really going to solve my marketing problems. It, it might be for certain problems that, that you know, that, that there's a very real use case where that is the answer, but just basically what, what do you want to do? How do you want to do it? Because you'll need to, 
you know, it's like, uh, is, uh, is it CCPA, the California thing? I think that's going to another state now. That G is at that ball. It's only going to be more, let's make sure privacy is, is a thing. We've got to think about that value exchange. If you've got a good value exchange, you, you're off to the races. But if you're just rushing through and take, trying to tick spot, do tick box exercises or think, those guys are doing that. I need to do that too. And you're not thinking about it. You, you know, you're going to run into trouble because the, 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 the audience or the consumer, they won't stand for it. As, as we become more digitally savvy. What's the biggest hurdle that you might hear if you're a salesperson or a marketer of your company? What's the biggest argument against your company? If you said I could have a magic wand or a genie and I could make one wish, it'd be like, I'd want to just educate the market on the status quo might work just well enough, but there's a better way of doing things. And it's not just better for you, it's better for, for the end users. Um, mm -hmm. Flipping it around to the, the sort of the end audience side, it's a kind of tricky one because you kind of want to long for the ride a little bit. You've got where you go to get your information, you know, the journals, you might go to the medical education. You've got places where you go. Um, what I would really say is, if I say would like go to the partners or the, the use the resources where you feel like you get the most value and wherever you're using a resource where there's value, but something's annoying you try and find some sort of feedback loop to, to put that in. And, you know, if you do find something that's getting you down, share it with your colleagues and, you know, try and, cause that, that. You're sort of always voting with your feet, um, yeah. you know, if there's certain platforms or apps or websites that are giving a, a crappy experience, um, and you can get that information elsewhere, go to the place that, that does it, you know, because that's what will drive change. If you put up with a subpar experience, you can't ever expect that experience to change. Now, the exception is like, there's only one game in town. Obviously, because, but then anywhere there's one game in town, the nature of the environment now, they'll be an upstart. I've talked to some of my guests about blockchain and they said how valuable that is for things like research, because if somebody puts information of me in a research finding, by the time it gets to this other company, they want to make sure that my weight hasn't changed by an error. Someone put the wrong decimal in or things like that. It adds a lot of substance and confidence to that. Your stuff, though, is almost the opposite because it's HIPAA compliant, so you don't really want to nail down those things. But is there a place for the blockchain in this kind of a thought process anywhere? Yeah, um, so yes. Blo blockchain is super interesting. It kind of... It went through a real buzzword patch and it's, sort of, it's, it's died down. I think that the premise of block, well, it, it, almost any industry where you are through digital handshake, um, doing stuff with data could benefit from a, the right application of blockchain. Say we get to this utopian future where everyone is very savvy about, well, you know, I have, I, I, you know, I have data about me online and how I, I use digitally. I'm going to consent that data in those. So you can, yes, you can know that I'm a doctor, but no, you can't know my name or whatever. So as people get more data savvy, companies will pop up or probably existing companies will start to use blockchain to keep an accurate record of what can and can't be used. Um, in the, no one's really done it at scale in a really good way at the moment. But the cool thing for sort of just digital advertising in general is making sure, you know, getting rid of, um, you know, ad fraud, which, you know, not a very big problem in, in our very sort of niche specialized industry, but, you know, it, it billions and billions of dollars, you know, like fund it, you know, like serious 
career sort of criminal stuff to build these sort of algorithms and bot. You know, to your question about am I a human, building bots and things like that. Blockchain, if you think, well, there's a website publisher and there's someone who's gone to that website to look at the content and then there's someone who, an advertiser who's paying for adverts on that. The, using the blockchain to know, well, how many intermediaries sit between the advertiser and who owns the publisher and what are they all doing? Um, the publisher wants to know that and the advertiser, because the advertiser says, if I spend a dollar and the publisher is only getting 50 cents, is that okay? It might be okay because there might be 50 cents of value in between, but blockchain will allow you to see that. And then from the user going to the publisher, it's a, well, what am I okay with that publisher knowing about me? And then what am I okay with that publisher then sharing with an advertiser or another third party? Or, you know, the blockchain for the user going straight to the advertiser because you have a relationship with, with the file rack. So the, the technology is very interesting. Um, and yeah, there's loads of cool ways that you can use it. Not really taken off. It's not sort of hit sort of critical mass in the consumer world yet. We keep definitely keep an eye on it. Because I think once someone does a really good job, there's a few companies using it for anti-fraud and things like that. But there's already good companies out there that are solving the fraud for ad fraud problem without the use of blockchain. So just going, oh, well, we do it with blockchain. Is it, 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 Great, blockchain's a really novel technology, but how are you applying it? So we keep, we're keeping a very close eye on what's happening in that consumer world because as soon as someone comes up with that killer use case, we can then we can bring it across. But it is a it's a it's a very cool novel technology. But I'll come back to the what I was saying earlier about the what do you want to do? What's the what is the challenge or the problem you're trying to solve? And if blockchain's the right tool, it, it could you know use it. It either has to be cheaper and easier and more efficient than anything we have, which we're not close to. Let's say that's 10 years away, or it has to be a real specific use that really any other way can't do a good job of doing it. Then it's like, let's introduce blockchain and do it. But just to do it because you can do it, it's premature for that. Yeah. So they're in the advertising industry. It was, we, it was a running joke every year. So probably about 10 years ago now, or oh, no, but man, 10, 10, between 10 and five years ago, every year was the year of mobile. Like everything was going to go mobile. And it never, it, it seemed like every year was the year, but it, it never happened. But then suddenly it was synonymous. Like every, you know, everything was smartphones, desktops were, it just, it just, and it, it kind of didn't happen overnight, but. It was, oh, yeah, mobile, mobile. And then we kind of almost forgot about it. And it's, oh, wow. And I think the same thing will happen with blockchain. It's like, oh, it's amazing. You can do all this stuff. And probably in five years or 10 years' time, blockchain will be powering a whole load of what we do now in a more efficient manner. But I don't, and I'll probably, I, I'm prepared to be wrong on this, but I don't think there'll be this big, oh, blockchain solving the problems. I just think it all, Suddenly, it'll be synonymous with a whole, it'll just be in the background. Um, and it, it'll sort of just come in under the radar and help us solve the problems we're solving now in a better way. But I don't think it'll disrupt the, the end user. If it's done well, the end user won't be too, it won't be this big like, well, bang, now it's blockchain. It's like, oh, just incrementally better. And I think it's also going to go through the dot com. You know, it's this, then it's the bubble. Then it gradually comes up. And same with cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency, I know, is with the blockchain, but then you might see a blockchain bubble. Maybe if a couple people do it effectively, we'll just kind of wait till it hits bottom after about six or seven years. When it's on its way up, we can get into it then. If I if we're making a dollar bet, I would say in 10 years' time, it'll be everywhere. But within that 10 years, the one we as a society won't, won't see that change. I think it will just seamlessly come in. But that's my dollar bet. That's interesting stuff. I love talking about that behind the scenes because I just don't get it anywhere and get someone like you that will share your time. It's really fun to see that. Thanks for that and keep doing what you're doing. No, my pleasure. And um, thank you for having me. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. Thank you.